You're listening to The Kylo Show, the podcast where we talk about how to keep your love on no matter what and why whole healthy families are going to save the world. In last week's episode, we talked about how the rescuer can do more harm than good when they act irresponsibly. In this week's episode, Danny and Brittany are going to talk about how the rescuer can build a life they actually want to live in, set healthy boundaries, and allow God to be the real rescuer. This is the last episode in the series, and it starts right now. Hello, everybody. <laughs> we're back. Again. Yes. We're here. We're here to pilot. rescue. Yeah. No, no. No, we're not. But we are here on the Kylo <laughs> Show, just in case you missed that. But we're still talking about the rescuer. We're jumping into the second part of it and, mm-hmm. and really just trying to help create clarity and help you guys keep from diving into it because we don't want you to do that. So It's a trap. It is a trap. It's a trap. Run away. <laughs> Run away from this trap. Christians it, like the rescuer, uh, I think, a lot. I mean, I guess they everybody likes all of the different phases. We do. We have a we have the answer, mm. and that you know that kind of does something to you when you have the answer. So yeah. It, uh, it kind of reframes everybody else's problems because you have the answer. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> you're like, Jesus. Well, that's that, a lot of that is super true, and you're not listening. <laughs> and yeah, yes. that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> and All that. I didn't even ask for your help. Mm-hmm. And that's where you get in trouble. That is that is definitely the hook. That's hook for me, mm. for sure. I'm hooked in by that one um, better than I used to be, mm. I will say. But I, yeah, I think the early years of my social work mm-hmm. practice, you know, um, while I was getting my degrees and and we were working in group homes, and then I was I was just surrounded by absolute poverty, drug addiction, calamity, domestic violence. It was everywhere, mm-hmm. and they're just it. I mean, talk about feeling powerless. Yeah, sure. Is you get called into these situations. There's babies involved. There's you know abused women. There's m- men who are self destructive and just a other destructive you're like oh my gosh you guys are all going to prison you know you're going to lose your children you're going to die what how can i help yeah and i remember a a times i don't know if it was off and on probably for two or three years where i was depressed Hmm. i was so stressed out so overwhelmed so a whole bunch of what we, we talk about mm-hmm. is from all these different lessons in mine and my, your mom's <laughs> yeah. life, you know, we like, oh, this is going to kill me. What do I got to do? And that's where I, I, I kind of simultaneously learned about the parenting stuff and the codependency stuff mm-hmm. in the same package. I just grew in self-awareness quickly. We did. We you know we came across the love and logic material. Uh-huh. Came across the codependent no more. Mm-hmm. All these things that I'd never heard anything about. And as soon as I did, the boom, <laughs> as my friends in England say, the penny dropped. Oh, okay. The penny <laughs> dropped, and as soon as the penny dropped, woof. Okay, yeah. I am going to be doing some very different things. And then and then you just start finding all these other resources that are trying to communicate things that are in the Bible that no teacher or preacher ever told you. Hmm. Like, hmm. Maybe Joyce Meyer. Joyce <laughs> Meyer was trying to tell everybody, but she was outside of my realm. I, I never heard Joyce. And But there is a lot of really great stuff out there on how to be helpful mm-hmm. and not be... A rescuer. A rescuer, a codependent, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you went straight from social work to becoming a pastor for your first time. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that just kind of continued it it was and, social work and it was <laughs> you know pastoring was social work i got in here well, look at all these people <laughs> it's the same there's thing. people everywhere yeah it's yeah. the same thing i don't remember the the social work days as much as a kid i remember mom would tell me that you'd come home some nights and just kiss us all in bed after crazy days but i remember more the pastor days mm-hmm. of you know i remember a lady following us home from the grocery store and following us in the grocery store trying to talk to you about her husband 
then following us home and then unloading the groceries from the car to the house and she's still talking and I'm just like these people are crazy. Yeah, th- well that was a that was a, a borderline personality disorder yeah, that well, was again, uh, I didn't know that diagnosed and was just you know yeah. other than calling the police which I probably mentioned to her. Yeah. She wasn't going to relent. Yeah. It's just crazy to think about like those I remember a few of those older and more pastor days. And and the number of you know police officers that actually came to our church mm. you know at at Mountain Chapel but also at Bethel. Mm. Yeah. You know there that's something that's not written into the revival <laughs> central lore is oh and once a month Reading Police Department hauled somebody away in a police car because of boundaries. Yeah. Well, that's a... You know, like, that's hey, definitely not in there. We, you know, Jesus is the way, truth, and ride to jail. You know, you're like, goodness <laughs> sake. It was... Uh, <laughs> I don't remember that part. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in there. Uh-huh. But, but it, 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 it could easily be because of the attraction to freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, when, people, when you create a place that's free and... So it might be just a, a, a great family or lots of money. If you have lots of money, you better have really great boundaries mm-hmm. because everybody sees you as a, the fixer. You're the rescuer. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you have a, a, a position of power, you're a rescuer. Mm-hmm. If you, that, that's how people tend to view uh, in that triangulation, in that irresponsibility cycle, the victim broadcasts mm-hmm. that you should help me. Yeah. And if you don't have self-control and boundaries, then you agree. Yeah. Like why wouldn't I give that person a check for $10,000? Mm-hmm. Cuz they will kill themselves. Mm-hmm. They will kill themselves if they just had $10,000, they would buy $10,000 worth of problems. Yeah. You just got back from a trip and you were telling us how you ran into um this young girl, Anya, mm-hmm. who is now 18. Mm, you're going to make me cry. I, well, I'm not going to try and make you cry. But okay. the in, in Culture of Honor is the first chapter, I believe, is the story of Josh and Robin. Yeah. So if you haven't read that, you might want to pause and go see if you find it because mm. it's a long, beautiful story. Yeah. I don't know that we'll have the ability to tell all of it. But they made a huge mess. They got pregnant. They got pregnant in second year school ministry. Yes, they are the heroes of our new supernatural oh, school of ministry. Right, all of that. <laughs> and they get pregnant. They're not married. And um, and then Anya, you know, but in this process, I mean, there's lots of opportunities for them to be a victim, be a bad guy, need rescuers. I mean... Yeah. It feels like they had the opportunity to just dive into all all of those options at some point. Yeah, and, and we're lifting this off of a family or off of couples and putting it into a church setting right now, and that's uh, this a fantastic example is that, you know, these, these two basically mismanage their freedom mm-hmm. and their sex drives, and they end up, pregnant the summer before their wedding in December, right? Mm-hmm. So they are going to show up four months pregnant. Yeah. And they're in an environment that doesn't do it that way. Mm-hmm. You know, this is this is the church. This is a, 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 or a, a revival school. You know, this is a lot of, there's a lot of pressure here to not do anything wrong. And it's going to be very difficult walking around always <laughs> pregnant and yeah. everybody knows, hey, you're not married yet. What, what's yeah. going on? So it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A, a, a scandal. You know, mm. there's a, we have a scandal here. So they made the front page. Yeah, it's definitely going to hit the front page, and it does. And uh, so we start sorting through it, and um, it's a new concept, really, to the whole leadership team to walk them through their problem, gain repentance, find reconciliation, and restore them. Mm. Because really, the first, the first thing is, okay, we need to dismiss them from the school. That was, that right. was the... And I said, whoa, 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 hey, hey, 
hey, let's try something. Let's try something that I'm... How many times have you said that? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Let me try something. Let, let's just figure, hey, I think this is going to work. And you know, and the other leaders around me said, boy, this better work. Mm-hmm. I'm like, it will. Well, it could. It yeah. might. I yeah. hope it does. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> not 100%, 75, 10, m- okay. maybe. Uh, well, I'm not controlling that. I don't know. I just think that we should try something. Yeah. And in doing so, you know, they saw themselves as bad guys mm-hmm. in my office. They really were expecting to be punished. They were expecting to be cast into outer darkness. You know, they were they really felt like the bad guys. And they felt like a victim of each other. Mm-hmm. And there were no rescuers to be found. Maybe someday when they told their story, there would be people would, you know, make us the bad guy or whatever. But Pushing in, finding the problem, they repent beautifully. They uh, they clean up their mess beautifully. The s- other students reconcile beautifully. The whole thing is restored, and then Anya is born in May, mm-hmm. and it's tragedy. Yeah, you know, I don't, I can't even remember what it was. I, I there was something to do with her heart. I believe I thought she had some kind of. Um, she was just, she was going to die. Yeah, she's an infant, and she is declining rapidly, yeah. and there's nothing that the doctors can they do. They need an absolute miracle because they, there's no hope it, they've got. It was like a month long, Yeah, it was and it just months. was getting worse every day. Uh-huh. And it's all in that first chapter. It's a beautiful story. But anyway, the, the point of you bringing this up was I got to meet Anya uh-huh. as a Adult, she's 18 years old. That's true. And she's going to the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. So, boom. Super. Oh, man, that was. I was so delighted to see her. And she's just a beautiful girl. Mm -hmm. It's just fun that that story is, you know, again, I think when Josh and Robin made themselves the bad guy, you know, um, the opportunity to, you know, I don't think you were the rescuer, which I, this is a question I have is a lot of people believe or maybe have verb, the verbiage around this is that people that are, have a problem, they need someone to help them find that they have a problem, which is the rescuer normally is is the kind of the wording we are using here. But for you, you weren't the rescuer there. So how do you navigate that, not being the rescuer, but willing to fight for them against the leadership team? Yeah, I I think the the difference between help and rescue is where's the responsibility. Okay. So the rescuer takes a responsibility, Mm -hmm. whereas the helper empowers the people who have the problem to be able to respond, you know, so they get the responsibility. ability to respond. Mm -hmm. And I I think that mastering the skills of helping people find the problem and then helping people uh, find what's causing the problem and then helping the people address the, usually the wound, Mm. the broken spot that's causing this problem, and then holding them accountable to clean up the mess that this problem has created and then being a part of, maybe if they want you to, being a part of creating a plan to now walk forward purposefully and diligently addressing the problem so that it heals and reconciling where they can and moving on towards restoration. I think those are the the role of the helper. Whereas a rescuer, I mean, you know, an ambulance driver is a rescuer because they're dealing with somebody that just can't fix themselves. You know, they can't, they're unconscious. Mm -hmm. They're Mm -hmm. they're out of commission. They're going to be sitting in a bed for a while. But eventually somebody's going to say, we did a quadruple bypass, and it's because you eat too many cheese bacon burgers. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you'll get another visit if you don't change anything. What are you going to do? Yeah. Now, here comes the help. 
Like, okay. here's what caused that massive heart attack that the ambulance drivers found. So, you know, coming in and taking him out of you know, uh, death, yeah. basically, got you to the hospital, doctor assessed the situation. These are all rescues. But there comes, on the other side, help. Yeah. Okay, help is you find your problem, you address your problem, you change. Mm-hmm. So I guess really the diff- one of the things I'm hearing for the difference of a rescuer and helper is the rescuer is going to hold a form of accountability where the helper is going to hold that, but the rescuer won't. Yeah, it's just not the, it's not the rescuer's job. The rescuer's job is to come in and to deal with the incoherent person right, and get them out of harm's way. But that's not help. Mm-hmm. That's a rescue. The firemen run in, and there's somebody unconscious under the beds. You know, they're they're dying from smoke inhalation. They get them out of that building. They get them some oxygen, maybe, or they get them in an ambulance, take them to hospital. Blah, 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 da da, rescued. Uh, if that person fell asleep in bed smoking and they lit their bed on fire, then we've not solved the problem yet. Yeah. Yeah. We've just got the person out of the fire, but they'll light another bed on fire if they need if to. They, yeah. So what are the likelinesses of people needing to be a rescuer based off of your description of the fireman and the ambulance driver? Uh, rarely. Rarely, It's yeah. rarely, you know. And uh, the helper is more likely that's needed. And and what but what a rescuer will do is they will justify the rescue. Mm. You know, they'll say, well, there's children involved. Uh-huh. You know, well, they're, they're going to lose their house. Uh-huh. Well, you know, they're, you know something tried. I, I, let me fast forward this. Yeah. And, and But that isn't happening. Right. Like, I, like I have some friends that um, one of the parents is a, constantly inebriated alcoholic and they have a number of children and i i'm watching people around them right now going we should do something Mm -hmm. well what yeah what can you do i mean you can pray that 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 person will get arrested for drunk driving you know you can pray that that uh, it's just a crazy thing to pray. I know, <laughs> I know. You can you can pray that that maybe that there there's a child or two in the car when that happens because mm-hmm. it's happening now and they're just it's just dangerous, dangerous. Yeah. It's just dangerous. But all these people who are not police officers, who are not probation officers, who are not attorneys, who are not yeah. connected to a legal solution, because this person does not have a problem. Yeah, they do not want an answer and every that's what's scaring everybody is that this has been going on for a while and it it's hard to watch that but this planet is full of that Mm -hmm. and you know i remember the, the the as a pastor i i reported five cases of child abuse or domestic violence to the police that went to court hmm. and people were charged. Hmm. Now, I engaged the mechanism for them to be held accountable to the authorities they're actually accountable to. When you beat up your wife or hurt one of your children, you're not accountable to pastors. Yeah. And a, and a pastor overstepping his jurisdiction is an enabler. Mm. Because if you're molesting your child and the pastor calls you in and says, hey, knock it off. And you go, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then you leave town. Yeah. And you, you molested three children in the children's ministry and your own children, and now you left town and nobody knows where you went. Mm. And so you've now enabled this situation to get worse and to continue on, and it will. Yeah. So when the police get involved and the courts get involved and probation and parole get involved, you won't be leaving town without a posse chasing you through mm-hmm. the 
desert. Yeah. You know? And so that's the difference, really, is where does your jurisdiction stop mm. as a spouse, as a parent, as a pastor, as a friend? Like, where does your... Because if you go past that, you're actually now part of the problem. Mm. So that's a good indicator of helper and rescuer. I think that was really helpful to clarify in the the roles because, again, we're, we want to help and we want to, you know, help people be powerful, but that line of rescuer to helper and then someone that has a problem or not yeah. and the jurisdiction, I like that. That was good. Okay. Well, that was ending on a heavy note. Oh, well. But... I mean, it's all real stuff. I, we've Sorry. got to talk about this this <laughs> real stuff that happens. And guys, we've got to chase after those whole healthy families because this stuff is out there. So, man, yeah. we believe in you. But we are going to go to questions right okay. now, and we'll dive into those. But um, this was good. Good. Yeah. All right. I know I've been talking a whole bunch about the brand-new Life Academy course, Unpunishable. I'm just super excited because I know that it's awesome. But something else that's awesome, Danny's book, Unpunishable. And if you haven't read it yet, you need to. Danny has said so himself. This is his favorite book that he's ever written. So if you're a Danny fan or you like anything that he's ever put out, you got to go read this book. In Unpunishable, Danny beautifully articulates the unpunishable message with real life example, story, and practical applications. And you're just going to love it. So I want you to go to Loving On Purpose dot com and click store to get the unpunishable book today okay so our first question comes from amy good hi daniel Brittany. thank you so much for doing the kylo show i have a question i am working on not being a rescuer and reminding myself that i can't help anyone who doesn't have a problem but when the person I'm talking to realizes that they do have a problem, how do I help them or walk with them in solving their problem without jumping into that rescuer role? Thanks for everything you do. I look forward to your answer. I think that's where the trap starts to happen. It's mm -hmm. like you get excited. They found it. They have a problem. Okay. And if you're not paying attention, all of a sudden you totally just stepped over and you're now doing everything for them. But um, my first thought comes to really getting good at what those questions are. Mm -hmm. And empathy. Yeah. I, I think that you have got to live in empathy while people struggle. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that we want to rescue people from is their struggle. I tell parents this all the time. Let your child struggle. <laughs> just let them fail. Just and it's like, oh, it's just <laughs> such a counterintuitive move to let uh -huh. somebody fail. Because we are so jacked with success that you're like, okay, you're going to have to let this person struggle. Mm -hmm. you're like, but they're off to such a great start. You know, this was, the, they totally found the problem. <laughs> they they had a great plan. They were doing it. And then, yeah. like, right. So now they have a new problem. Yeah. So we're, we're kind of in the second phase of the whole, which is... Oh my gosh, you look really frustrated. You look really defeated. You look really anxious. You are, are you scared as you look? You look really scared. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And you just park yourself there until they find out that next thing. Mm -hmm. And whether you're walking a friend through a diet or a drug addiction, it, mm -hmm. it's the same process. Mm -hmm. They are going to have to figure out, okay, what am I going to do with this wall that I hit? So question there, when you say, so what are you going to do? And they go, I don't know. What do you say next? I say, what a bummer to not know what to do right here. Well, I guess you could do nothing. How would that work out? Mm -hmm. I guess you could make some more excuses like you used to do. Remember all those excuses <laughs> you used to make? Oh, I mean, that was hilarious, wasn't it? You know, I mean, you could, you can just be in that situation, but start the five E's over again. Mm -hmm. Just kind of hit reset, and here we go. So I guess if you're l helping people or find yourself in this, the five E's should be bookmarkers somewhere yeah. or a poster in your office. Magnet on your forehead. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, tattoo on your forearm, <laughs> something. Those five E's need to be a quick reference. Yeah. And so camping out in the empathy 
and just question after question after question. I'm so that would be that's really painful. I'm so sorry. You know, what do you want to do about this pain? You know, mm-hmm. those type of things. Just kind of going back to that main question of what are you going to do in different ways. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm hearing. And and a lot of people that that find themselves new to this process are kind of thrown by being lied to. Mm. You know? <laughs> you, <laughs> Not new to that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of shocking when somebody lies to your face. Yeah. And and they and they they found the problem, they came up with a plan, and they executed the plan for a day. Yeah. And then they're right back to what they were doing. You're like, wait, wait a second. You say, yeah. wait, hey, you prom- you you know what? Hey. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, you know, and here we go, right back to the victim. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah. okay, this is going to take a while. This is why they keep saying, don't work harder on other people's problems than they do. Yeah. And that's exactly right. Mm. Yeah. Well, that was a good question, Amy. Thank you for mm-hmm. that. Okay, so the next question we have comes from Natalie. Hey, Danny and Britt. Thank you so much for doing the Kylo Show. I am definitely one of your number one fans. I do have a question, though. So I've read Keep Your Love On, and I'm working through owning what's mine and letting go and letting others uh, own what's theirs. It's real growth. However, there are times um, when other people I'm in relationship with will not own what's theirs. And so I'm wondering, how do I remain powerful in that situation and those situations, and what do I do? Thanks so much. Will not. They will will not not own they will not. And that is super frustrating. <laughs> Which you can hear that in Natalie's response. <laughs> She's very frustrated. They will not own their stuff because you're like doing everything. And they just don't change. Mm. That part gets you where you want to become a bad guy, I think. It's where you're uh, what, easily come out next for me. It's, it's pressure. It's disappointing. It's hurt. It, uh, it, you know, you want to keep this person in this place in your life. But if they are not going to deal with this thing that is damaging the... Relationship? Either, well, either your quality of life mm, mm-hmm. or your connection with that person, there's going to be a boundary. Yeah. And we're going to find where they actually do fit and they can keep doing that thing they're doing. Uh-huh. And they, So it'd be like if you, know, if you had a really close friend that just randomly poop their pants. You're like, yeah. oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what are you doing? You can't just do that. And I go, well, I did it. You know, you just got to live with it. You know, you said you're going to love me. Well, I can love you from another town, right? Like, we are not going to be having coffee and you just do that. Okay, that is not going to work with me. And that could be an anger problem. That could be a drug or alcohol issue. And maybe they have a hard time telling the truth. Mm. Maybe every once in a while they just randomly just kind of lie their face off. You know, like, what are you doing? These are the kinds of things that you have to decide, how long am I going to be with this? Mm-hmm. And you you think, whoa, oh, gosh, you did not. <laughs> what? And you're looking, and pretty soon you're in the car. You know, I'll talk to you on the phone in my car, but you are not riding with you're me. You're not in my car. You're yeah. not riding mm-hmm. with me. And so there, there I, I make it... it silly and extreme mm-hmm. to make a point but the point is you would start setting limits with that yeah but for whatever reason maybe you've been trained to hang in there with a really angry disrespectful person or somebody that just keeps relapsing in their addictions mm-hmm. or whatever it is maybe you were trained in that maybe you have a spot in your lifestyle that says uh i have a set of skills mm-hmm. that will enable this yeah. I can do this for a long time. Like, right, what are you going to do with that problem? Because you are now working harder on this person's problem to keep them in your life and your quality of life, meaning that maybe the lessons your children are learning, maybe the the disrespect that you experience in relationships... Uh, maybe other people are leaving your friend circle because of the damage this person, whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, maybe this person works for you and keeps, you know, they just they just got arrested for driving your delivery truck 
drunk, mm. whatever. There's ways that the quality of your life is plummeting by working harder on their problem than they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think the boundaries piece is by far the best response rather than getting angry and trying to tell them of all the things that are theirs. Of what to change. Yeah, yeah. because no, they're not listening. How dare you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then it just turns into more problems. So I think definitely the what am I going to do to change the experience that I keep feeling from this person um, and unfortunately, if, if if it's friends or family and that that hard, you know, cement wall comes in, it feels like rejection. But the truth of it is like, I have to protect my heart and my life from your chaos and pain. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, those are hard. Great question from Natalie. Um, <laughs> Natalie's a friend of mine, which is why she called me Brit. So, um <laughs> But that was, that was great. So we're going to go ahead and move on to our testimony spot. Oh, good. Um, so we have a fun one, I'm sure. Can't wait. Okay, I'm stopping by just real quick. Last time, go get Unpunishable, the Life Academy course. Get the book. Anything Unpunishable, just go get it. You're going to love it. It's going to change your life, I promise. I'll leave now. Go do it. Thanks. Bye. All right, so we have a testimony from Allie. Hey, Danny and Brittany, it's Allie in San Diego. And it is really tough to know where to start a testimony about how Kylo has impacted my life because I feel like ever since I heard Danny speak on relationships and the father uh, and, and stuff like that at School of Ministry, I have just been arrested by this message. And I feel so grateful that I've had the privilege to partner with you in projects and even the show And because of that, I've gotten to watch how you live and seen that you practice what you preach and you keep your love on, you pursue connection, you are not punishing, you are um, keeping that goal of showing the Father's heart to people on. And um, that is just such a gift to me. Um, And I would say to things that seeing you and then learning from the Kylo message have done for me. One is I think that my personality type, as you know, is very self-critical. I'm a one on the Enneagram, so I have that perfectionist thing, that self-judgment thing. And being with people who are not punishing kind of confronts you with, wow, I, I, choose to be the punisher in my own life. I, God is not the punisher. My leaders and colleagues and friends are not the punisher. Even when I'm not doing my best or falling short, I, I'm the punisher. So I need to deal with that. And that has just brought me so much healing to let go of that role and to receive grace, to receive mercy <laughs> for myself and to just uh, go get closer to the, to the father. So thank you for that. And then the other thing I would say is that I so appreciate how you guys posture your heart and your life toward people who are making decisions that break your heart. And I have some people in my life who, um, are making choices that, you know, it's not just that I disagree with them. It's that I know that these things are going to have consequences and, and my heart hurts for them. And I think my instinct or inclination would be to just either worry or get in their face or feel like I need to try to fix the problem or feel overwhelmed and, and powerless to fix the problem. And watching you guys uh, posture your hearts where you don't try to rescue people you uh, talk to them, you pursue them, you confront, you ask, what are you doing? You um, keep communication open. Uh, You you have healthy boundaries, but you don't um, try to carry the person's life. You let them uh, make the choices they're gonna make. And, but I, I think because 
uh, what's behind that is I just see that you carry huge, huge hope and faith that God is the rescuer and God is the helper and his love is pursuing these people and that he is going to win in their lives. And that just gives me so much courage and hope to know how to love people who are in that position. We have to be confident that God is so big and so able to come in and change people's lives. And we need that faith for ourselves and we need that faith for others. And you guys walk in that. And that has given me, I think, so much freedom to to not worry, to not fix people, but to trust that the story is not over, even in a moment where I'm grieving someone's bad choice or whatever. I pray for them. I love them, but I put them in God's hands. And thank you guys for all that you do. I love you. (laughs) Allie. Yes. Allie. Allie's... uh dear dear to us she is she's a partner i mean she is she's very helped, very invested in she's this helped message write every book i've ever written yeah. she has just been an amazing sounding board and and she's helping us with this show a lot she is she's so, so that was a little snippet of <laughs> the kylo culture and how how it kind of plays out it, it kind of felt like a little affirmation circle too at the same time <laughs> <you know? laughs> <laughs> yes, Allie's been uh, done an amazing job of just helped so much um, with knowing the heart behind all that you know we do here, and and really, I, think, I mean, she's been around for every book. She's an insider. Yeah. So this is that was an insider talking right uh-huh. there. Which again, she we shared an office with Allie for a season, which was <laughs> you know fun because having your content writer around, you know, helping, you know, she was probably part of a million more meetings than she would have normally been just because she was in the office with us. And um, then she dumped us for San Diego. She did. Mm -hmm. She did. She followed her heart there. (laughs) Um, But it's, you know, the, the value that she has for this message is like everyone else. I feel like on our team, they're all sold out to, um, doing what they can to keep this message in the front of their lives, you know. So what Allie's talking about um, that she's watched you do, and, you know, she she got a front row seat to watching me have to go through a really hard season with Delaney and, you know, being on the other end of watching Delaney be celebrated, you know, victorious. And so it's fun to, when our team gets to, you know, see how so much of our message is kind of created. You know, it's in the the core being formed. Um, they get a front row seat, and so it's fun to hear um, just that truth. I think. Come yeah, it's like uh, you know, work working for Ferrari and then driving one. You <laughs> yeah, know, it's sure. kind of the same. <laughs> Think kind of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. totally. That's, that's what I would compare it to exactly, but. It is fun, and and I think uh, Mom always says practicing what you preach is overrated. Totally, because it's so hard. It is. Um, but you know, it is a, it is a wild thing to exercise, and um, you know, I, I'm grateful for, for all, all the team members we have. I'm grateful for. Allie is a super brain. If you didn't know that, I mean, she is so stinking smart. She thinks at a, a level that I can't compute in often. I'm like. Uh huh. You you're so smart, girl. Yeah. So smart. So, um, it's funny being. That's in what we do here, though, is we surround ourselves <laughs> with people smarter than us. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> she she makes us sound better. Uh, she she does a great job of that. So, fun to run with her. Fun to see her applying it. I mean, she's in a new chapter in her life, and um, excited for what's headed her way, mm-hmm. in in her relationships. So that's super fun. Yeah. I, I, as she was describing, just hanging in there with people that are close to you, mm-hmm. are you know whether they're your children or your friends or y- y- usually those. You know, it it's so hard to watch people you love do things that you know are gonna bring about 
tragedy if they continue. Yeah. And and keeping your love on means it doesn't mean that you don't confront it or that you don't tell the truth, but somehow you convey that I'm not judging you, meaning that I, there's no punisher, there's no guilty, innocent thing. It's it's I'm with you. Yeah. Can I communicate that I'm with you? Because I still don't know what you're going to do. Even though we're having this conversation and you're telling me all this stuff, I still don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> I've been, <laughs> I can't even tell you yeah. how many times I've been lied to. <laughs> and I think, well, I thought it would wreck me that if people didn't do what they said they were going to do, but it doesn't. Like, it doesn't change what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And so when people do a good job with it, it's the greatest thing in the world. It's the greatest experience in the world is hanging on through life. Mm-hmm. And when they need about 10 more punches from the snake, then you're like, all right, well, that's nine. <laughs> Okay. okay, eight. Okay, seven. I love you. Six. You know, hey, here we go. And um, those those get a little scary. But. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think family is always probably can be the most painful spot where we have to set hard boundaries or have hard conversations. Or, you know, and Natalie's... Uh, when they're not doing what they're supposed to do, they won't own their stuff and you can't do anything about it. It leaves you, it can leave you feeling powerless, which yeah. I think in that powerless state is where we tend to spiral and mm-hmm. start grasping for things that aren't real, mm-hmm. which is fake power, um, which is partnering with fear. So I think identifying, um, you know, if you're, in the cycle that you can get yourself in is, you know, being when the rescuer sets in, when the victim sets in, when the bad guy sets in, like, you know, what's going on internally in you um, in this exchange and how fast can you possibly get back to feeling powerful again Mm -hmm. and um, asking yourself a series of questions so that the rescuer doesn't stay part of your regular life, Mm -hmm. you know. And you know, d- really defining and settling into, am I going to be a rescuer or a helper? Mm-hmm. And and if I'm going to be a helper, then it has to help. Yeah. It can't just get them out of the burning building. Because, yeah, you rescued them, but now what? Yeah. Because that situation is still on fire, and do they want to go back in the building? Yeah. And I guess I would just... the powerful people live a life of freedom, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think every healthy family out there has to be led by someone that's powerful so that they have something to look to Mm -hmm. as this is what freedom looks like. And you can't have freedom without responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it starts with responsibility for yourself and then you can move out. But again, it's Am I empowering with my responsibility or am I enabling Mm -hmm. with my over responsibility? Yeah. And that's a a constant awareness that Mm -hmm. gets a little, gets a little cloudy. The, the closer the person is or the bigger the issue is, or probably the more rewards in it for me. Mm -hmm. We were talking about, uh, responsibility. Uh, we were just away for the weekend and, we got in this conversation about um, different personality makeups and different things like that. But, you know, the, the firstborn tends to carry the responsibility stick, um, but also C's on the disc profile can carry that responsibility stick, you know, and it, it shows up in many different ways, but we were just talking about how easy it is to overdo your responsibility in relationships and then the wreckage that happens when you do that out of the goodness yeah. of your heart. Yeah, any strength overused mm-hmm. becomes a weakness. Yeah, which is so true. Mm. Even here. Mm-hmm. So just as a reminder that those whole healthy families will save the world mm-hmm. and 
feel like we've ended our season on the triangulation and kind of abuse cycle that we were going through. Just encouraging you to chase after wholeness, chase after that feedback, chase after community that's willing to not take responsibility for your problem um, and really rise above what I feel like the normal is so easy to be a part of, Mm -hmm. you know, because that's, we're looking for something that is greater than just the standard. Don't look for a bad guy. Yep. Don't do it. Just say no. Just say no to bad guys. Just don't do it. (laughs) No matter how tempting it is, don't do the bad guy thing. And five principles. Mm -hmm. What are they again? No fear and love. (laughs) Be powerful. Yes. No No fear fear and love. love. Keep connection the goal. Uh Uh-huh. Healthy communication. Be respectful, you know, in your communication. Honor healthy boundaries. And honor healthy boundaries. That's that really is a recipe to be a whole healthy person Mm -hmm. who can go on to be a whole healthy well, create a whole healthy family. And save the world. That's it. Chasing after that. All right. No capes. No capes. No capes. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll see you guys next time on the Kylo Show. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. Make sure to join us next week when Danny and Brittany shift our focus to how the Kylo principles apply to singles. So if you're single, these episodes are going to be for you. And if you're not single, these episodes are still for you too because there's going to be a lot of great stuff that you can still apply to your life. Never miss an episode of The Kylo Show by subscribing to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or watch on the Loving on Purpose YouTube channel. And don't forget to submit your questions and testimonies to thekyloshow.com. The Kylo Show is produced by Ali Armading, co-produced by Ashley Beck, Leah Alexander, Anna Hill, and Sherry Silk. Sound engineer and edited by Taylor Silk and show promoter Christian Zamora. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.